Welcome back, or if you're new here, hello. My name's Tyler, and in case you didn't catch my little teaser a couple weeks ago, I am building a fully functioning scale model of Demon Drop at Thorny Park. This ride will be 100% fully functional, just like its real life counterpart, and more importantly, it'll look the same too. In this video, we're going to show you how I went from a pile of parts on the floor to a tower, and I will tell you how I designed it along the way. In the next video, I'll show you a little bit more about the tower mechanics and a couple of changes I had to make the design sense. Before we get into it, I just want to let you know that in a couple of recordings, you might hear my 3D printer running. It's a couple feet away from me. It's a fairly quiet machine, but the MMU can be kind of noisy on it, so please excuse me. I, you know, I, I'm trying to work on this YouTube and work on the project, so sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Demon Drop was marketed by Intamin and manufactured by Giovanola. Its model is called a Free Fall Tower, or some people call it the first generation drop tower. These were fairly popular rides back in the 80s, and from my basic research I found 18 were built. Most seem to have closed in the early to mid 2000s, and today only 5 exist. There's 3 in Japan, 1 in Italy, and 1 here in the United States. These rides were from a time where most engineering was done on paper and manufacturing processes were more manual. From what I can tell, the ride structure was built with I-beams, angle iron, and sheet steel. All off-the-shelf materials you can get from any metal supplier. Using off-the-shelf materials makes it so any shop can produce parts using widely available materials. These parts require a little more work than maybe cutting to length, drilling some holes, and maybe a couple of welds. Also, using structural members of standard shapes makes the engineering far easier. They could have definitely created a more sleek and customized structure using fabricated supports like flat rides of today, but that would increase the engineering complexity and therefore the cost. Remember, CAD didn't really catch on until the 90s, so the engineering was mostly done by hand. Of course, all that's just speculation on my part. One of the most complicated parts of the ride appears to be the ride vehicles, which I will from now on refer to as cabins. These appear to be aluminum bodied vehicles riveted and welded together into the slope rectangle shape. Each side of the cabin has three sets of wheels. Behind the riders are two sets with one above and one below the riders. The third set of wheels are actually two smaller wheels. These front wheels are used when the cabin is in its upright position. Having two wheels allows the cabins to move over small gaps in the track in the transfer position at the top of the tower. The rear top and front sets of wheels will alternate, which are attached to the track based off the position of the cabin in its cycle. There are no side friction or upstop wheels like you find on a roller coaster. These wheels are enclosed in a C-channel like track to prevent them from lifting off the track in sections where that would be an issue. To stop side-to-side -side movement, they use rub pads on the side of the cabins to keep it centered. To compensate for a lower coefficient of friction, they use a heavy amount of grease on the track. I was going to walk you all through the process of a ride cycle, but let's be honest. If you're here, you know how this ride works and what it does. If not, well, here's a video. If you'd like to know more about how this ride works, then I suggest taking a listen to this video by Ryan the Ride Mechanic. Now, just a quick disclaimer, I actually discovered this video well after I designed the model. Uh, so a couple of the mechanisms are very similar, but a lot of them are a little bit different. If you'd like a video where I compare the real life mechanisms to the mechanisms I built on the model, then let me know and I'd be glad to make something. Now that we know a little bit more about the ride, let's go over how I designed my model. I started by using Google Earth to get a rough idea of some of the dimensions of the ride. The park advertises it as being 131 feet tall with a 60 foot drop. That means the extra bits at the top and bottom of the ride are combined 71 feet tall. However, Giovanola and Intamin are both Swiss companies. This tells me that rather than using American units, they probably designed the ride with metric units, which conveniently 131 feet is just about 40 meters. 
I measured the tower itself being a 4x4 4 4 meter square base and the runout and station area being a 3x58 meter rectangular footprint. With this sense of scale of mind, I was able to start scaling down the ride. I copied some photos of the ride into my CAD program and used the tower dimensions to get a scale of the rest of the ride. These are all estimates, but I imagine that the engineers of the ride used nice even numbers wherever possible to make things easier for the fabricators. With that in mind, I estimate that the gauge between the rails is 3 meters. The tower is split into 9 sections of what I assume is 4 by 4 meter squares as indicated by the cross structures. This gives an extra 4 meters of height that are included on the top and bottom sections of the tower. The vertical columns are constructed with what appears to be 4 sections of stacked I-beams. I'm estimating that each are probably even in length and that would be about 10 meters. For the tower of the model, I chose to design and build it in four sections. To make these parts a little bit more 3D printer friendly and to keep that same look, I decided to actually create a U-shaped section that fills in the bottom of the I-beam. This way, I can print these sections flat against the print bed and reduce support material as much as possible. I can then face these two parts together so that from a distance, the model still looks like it was built with I-beams. I designed the tower to be printed in two large parts, a front face and a back face. These faces would be joined by additional cross members to form the sections of the tower. Each section is 300 millimeters long, which is a little challenging for my Mark IV to print. Of course, to fit these pieces on my Mark IV, I do have to print this in kind of a cursed orientation and let me print it and see how it looks. If I had a larger printer, I'd be able to print this face down like that, but I don't have one. Oh, they appear to be snapping off all right. Thankfully, my manager at work has a 5 tool head version of the Bruce XL, and he agreed to print the larger parts for me. Having access to a larger printer opens a lot of doors for me. If I can combine multiple parts into one, I can avoid screwed or glued joints, which will make the construction way more sturdy. Also, it makes it a lot easier, but that does lead to a question of how I will join all these parts together. In the past, I've used 0-80 machine screws in my projects like custom model roller coaster trains and track. They're cheap and small, and I'd like to use them in this project. In those other projects, I just use the screws to self-tap threads into the plastic parts, but I want to try to move away from that because I find it's way too easy to either strip the screw or strip the hole. If you've ever assembled a Prusa product with 3D printed components, you'll notice their love for square nuts. They design pockets into their prints where you can put in a square nut during assembly, and then you screw the parts together using that nut for the threads. This is in my opinion the strongest screw joint for 3D printing as you're clamping the plastic together rather than relying on the plastic hole holding a clamping force. It's also super cheap. For my model, I'm going to use these hex nuts in the pockets to accomplish the same thing. These are teeny little nuts, but this construction method works super well and from now on, I'm going to try to use this method in more of my models. To lift the cabins, I create a center rail with a sliding carriage attached. The carriage travels up and down the tower to raise the cabins. To raise them, I purchase a timing belt like what you would use on a 3D printer that loops around the rail. The rail then sets on this base where underneath I have a geared brush DC motor. The DC motors I'm using for this model are all the same for all the various pieces of it. These are cheap geared DC motors designed for simple Arduino RC cars. I initially considered using some of these motors I already had, then printing a gearbox, but honestly, this is just simpler. If I can purchase it for less than it takes for me to design it, I'm going to do that. The lift motor will mount to the base plate of the ride. To tension the belt, I added some slots into the motor mount to give me a little room to pull tension on it. It's not a ton of space, but I think it'll be fine. To move the cabins into this station, ready area, and into the lift, I've created a kicker wheel assembly. This is a simple printed wheel with an o-ring to provide grip to the cabins. These mount to a printed base that contains another motor, then I will tie the motors to the wheels using another o-ring as a belt. I built a prototype of this and they work well, but I do expect that eventually the o-rings will wear out and have difficulties gripping the cabins. 
base of the ride combines with a series of other smaller bases along the length of the model. These will be printed from a marble pet G to give me kind of a faux concrete look. It was cool in concept, but honestly the color didn't really come out the way I was hoping for it to. But I spent a lot of money on pet G, so I'm just going to roll with it. One thing I like to do for any part I design for 3D printing or even sheet metal parts is to add slots in the parts for alignment rather than holes. I find my Prusa generally holds tolerance within plus or minus a quarter millimeter, but this tolerance will stack up for large assemblies like this. Having slots will allow me to put the track and structural members wherever I need to for proper alignment without much of a hassle. I should have purchased washers for the screw heads, but I didn't, and I think I will need to come back and add some later. The bottom section of the tower sits on these foundation pieces that are screwed into the base plate. For future transportation of the model, I designed it so that the tower can be separated from the runout section of the model. The slots in the foundation pieces will allow me to line the tower up whenever it's reconstructed. That's all I really want to say about the design of the tower so far. Like I said in the next video, I'm going to talk about the mechanics that will actually raise and drop the cabins. Uh, so go ahead and enjoy a couple minutes of a montage of me assembling it.
So at this point, I'm going back to redo a couple of the fasteners. I, I realized that I really should have ordered some washers from the get-go, so I am thinking I'm going to go back and order some washers. They're like super cheap. Order some washers, put them in on the slotted holes, and that should help with some of the stability of the track pieces. Not that it's really an issue, but I did notice that as I torque them down, the screw heads are biting into the plastic and that's not great. So I think this is probably a great spot to leave the project. Uh, as you can see right now, I'm installing the last two teal pieces of the tower before I get into like the cosmetic stuff. And um, like I said, in the next video, I'm going to go over a little bit more of the mechanics of the tower, and I actually had to redesign a couple of parts. Here I go dropping it, but uh, I had to redesign a couple of parts, but it's not the end of the world, so I will get into that in a little bit more in the next video, but this video is getting long, so if you enjoyed watching me assemble this, please uh, go ahead and leave me a like, get subscribed. If you have any comments of future projects or things you'd like to see for this project, please let me know. There I go dropping it again. But uh, yeah, go ahead and let me know. And in the next video, like I said, I will be showing you how I went ahead and put the mechanics into this thing. And we should hopefully see some dropping cabins. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.